share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Can you all see that? Give me a couple thumbs up. Yes. All right, good. Yes. Okay. All right, we are off. So hi again, everyone. I'm Diane Kyle Hip. I'm a second year doctoral student at BGSU. And I'm really excited to talk with you today about a model that I've been developing called the spinning wheels. So this model is the basis for the article that I wrote that was accepted for publication in Organization Development Journal. So you see the model on your screen. I call it spinning wheels because there are three factors that spin in a circle and surround an organization. And those factors are resistance to change, cultural lock-in, and assumed continuity. And to the left is earlier success, and to the right are market forces. But because the organization is spinning in place, it cannot see the market forces. So when I think of spinning wheels, I see the image of a car stuck in the mud. Without traction, its tires spin, but the car doesn't move, it's just stuck in the mud. The car is expending a lot of energy, but not moving forward. And without some change in the situation, the car will continue to be stuck in the mud. Hence the metaphor that's commonly used when a person or a group is very busy, but accomplishing very little, they are spinning their wheels. Now, oftentimes they're blind to the fact that they're spinning their wheels because they're so busy doing their busy work, right? Another term with a similar connotation. So this metaphor really illustrates the spinning wheels model. Oops. So the image of spinning wheels came to mind when I was thinking about the commonalities between foreign companies. So today we're going to apply the model to two household name companies. And you're going to see how those companies suffered from the three factors in the model. These organizations were very busy following their processes, sending decisions up the chain of command. And more importantly, because they were spinning their wheels, they were blind to the fact that the market had moved in a different direction. So the spinning wheels organization will never reach the market's new destination without a change in its situation. Now, as I tell you the two stories, I want you to pay attention to a pattern of early innovation, then a settling in, and finally a full-blown spinning wheels phenomenon. So we'll move to our first company, a business that you're all familiar with, but depending on your age, you may have a different opinion of it. And that business is Kodak. So let's take a look at how Kodak became a household name. So 1877, just 12 years after the end of the Civil War, and photography was new technology, but it was messy, cumbersome, and bulky. And what we're looking at is a mobile developing room. Very few people had the equipment needed to develop the images onto paper. And then in 1879, George Eastman invented a machine which enabled him to mass produce photographic dry plates. Be exposed and developed at the photographer's convenience, not like wet plates that had to be coated, exposed at once, and developed while still wet. So in, in 1870, excuse me, so this box is a lot more convenient than the wagon we just saw. So this is the man, this is George Eastman. He's innovator and inventor. And in 1888, he invented something that would last until today, the name Kodak. The story goes, he liked how the word sounded and he liked the letter K. The Kodak camera was placed on the market with the slogan, you press the button and we do the rest. This was radical. People could take their own pictures. They didn't need to go to a professional photographer. So this was the birth of snapshot photography as millions of amateur picture takers know it today. Fact is, 
Kodak was an innovative company. What you see here are just some of the inventions patented by Eastman Kodak, and there are hundreds more. So you can imagine this company was focused on invention and innovation first and foremost. Kodak made photography available to the general public. And by 1976, Kodak had 120,000 employees, a 90% market share of film and an 85% market share of cameras. So likely you would have taken your photo with a Kodak camera that had Kodak film in it. And when you got it developed, it was printed on Kodak paper. Talk about dominance. So how did this behemoth get to a point where it was forced to file bankruptcy in 2012? Well, I think we all know something about their story. After all, we all probably have a camera in our pockets and it's not Kodak and it doesn't have film in it. Most people think the advent of the digital camera marked the beginning of the end for Kodak, but guess who invented the digital camera? Kodak in 1975. So when employee Steve Sasson took his idea to the marketing department, they said no. They refused to sell it. They didn't want it taking off because it would detract from film sales. So you've already figured out that Kodak was resistant to change. And what is resistance to change? Well, in simple terms, it's a pushback to something new. And it could be for a good reason, or it could be just because it's new and uncertain. But when an organization resists change, especially towards market forces, there can be serious consequences. Now, Kodak was also victim to assumed continuity. And this concept means that a company simply assumes that it will continue to exist because it has in the past. Kodak was untouchable for over 70 years. No one at the company would have guessed that less than 50 years later, it would be struggling for its own survival. So what's going on inside a company that suffers from assumed continuity? Well, it's an arrogance about its own existence, an ego, a slow pace of change, because after all, they think no one can catch them. In Kodak's case, saying that film was dead was blasphemous. They didn't want to cannibalize themselves. Their entire company and most of their profits were built around film. So let's finish the story of Kodak. In 1996, Kodak had 16 billion in sales. And in 2012, the year they filed bankruptcy, they had 4 billion in sales. Now Kodak still exists today. It's a global printing and imaging company and they serve mostly businesses. And guess what? They're innovating again. They developed a way to add gold ink to printed pieces and created a special paper that gives the look and feel of photo paper when used in electrophotographic digital presses. But it took the market to drive innovation back into Kodak. And unfortunately, bankruptcy was the price it paid for assuming its own continuation. Okay, so with Kodak, we saw an organization resistant to change because it assumed its own future. To address the last factor, cultural lock-in, let's talk about the second household name company, Sears Roebuck. So Sears is like Kodak in that it, its heyday peaked over half a century ago. So let's learn a little bit about Sears. Here's the man, Richard Warren Sears. He started Sears Roebuck in the 1800s as a mail order company. They were famous for catalogs that offered rural America access to anything city dwellers could get. Sears taught America how to shop. It offered thrifty prices and products that people needed. Many of the Sears innovations were in how it distributed its products and controlled costs. 
It displayed its distribution facility on the back of every catalog to impress customers about the size and scope of Sears. But when mail order became a dinosaur, Sears innovated by opening department stores in the suburbs. So by the mid 1950s, Sears had over 700 stores across the country. And Sears also developed numerous brands that consumers were extremely loyal to. Kenmore, Craftsman, Die Hard. People bought these brands without question and without hesitation. So what started Sears' decline in market share? Well, it was competition in the suburban department store base especially a store that marketed low prices. Yes, Walmart. So by 1991, Walmart had beaten Sears for the number one spot as the nation's largest retailer. But let's talk about what was going on inside Sears. So in 1987, Don Katz published a book called The Big Store, and it was based on firsthand knowledge of the C-suite at Sears. Mr. Katz followed the CEO around for over two years, was given unrestricted access to memos, documents, meetings, and interviews with other executives. He learned that an outsider hadn't been hired in the senior ranks of 17,000 workers. And in his 600 page book, he described the culture at Sears using these terms, a faceless bureaucracy, a closed introverted world, decades of entrenched behavior, top-down control, cultish, and my favorite, career Searsmen. So Katz reports that the Sears leaders would say, all we need to do is what we do a little better. And there was conviction within the company that Sears could never be stopped. So it's obvious that Sears suffered from cultural lock-in, our third factor. The culture that Katz described was so dysfunctional, you wouldn't know where to start to fix it. Cultural lock-in says that culture is so ingrained that it actually paralyzes the company from seeing what's really going on within the company and outside in the market. So in 2018, Sears filed for bankruptcy. Today, it has 425 locations between Sears and Kmart, a drop from 3,500 locations in its heyday. And that brings us back to our model. And really, as we look at these two companies, I think you could effectively argue that Kodak and Sears suffered from all three of these factors. And of course, we see what happened to them. Now, I believe this model is applicable to large and small businesses. And since my entire career has been spent in small business, I'm especially interested in how the factors interact in this segment of our economy. I also believe that there's a remedy for the model, a way to get traction, to stop the spinning wheels and get in tune with market forces. Now that's beyond the scope of this paper, but it is a natural next step. So I'm very interested in your thoughts about the model because it does need further research, but I'm gonna pass back to Gary who will walk us through the next part of our program. Thanks, Diane. Um, that was a really, really great presentation. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot we can take away from that. I'll try to highlight a few of the aspects of it that I that I take away. You know, I, I, I think this this presentation in the paper that Diane wrote that it's based on is it's kind of like a cautionary tale. You know, anyone in a position of leadership should take note of of this spinning wheels idea that that in model that that Diane has created here. Um, the aspects of resistance to change, uh, cultural lock in and assumed continuity um, and they're, they're very related, very much related to each other. And, you know, culture has a lot to do with, with some of that. Um, <clears throat> you know, anybody who's a, a business student um, or, or just going into business should, should look at what happened with Kodak and Sears and study that as a good example of, of what not to do. Now, they've, 
they did some really good things to get where they were, um, but in the end, uh, not so much. Um, it, and just to take a, a quick look back at um, uh, at some of what Diane was talking about, you know, Kodak was afraid of the digital camera. It was they were afraid it would destroy their their film and and printing business, and that. But if 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 you can develop a product that's going to destroy your current products, then what's to stop it someone else from doing the same thing? Kodak actually patented the digital camera and actually made billions off of the the patent licensing the patent but when the patent ran out it only took five more years for Kodak to, to file bankruptcy so um, and if if they couldn't see the writing on the wall in 30 years <laughs> there's definitely something wrong there um, and and Sears Sears actually made the change from catalog uh, being largely catalog based to the big box stores that we that we know today but when the catalog became an online medium instead of a paper book that got delivered um, they couldn't successfully make that change back so they innovated one way but couldn't innovate back the other way um, with with the times so uh, which is a, a a real head scratcher I think for most people when they look at that um, so any one of these uh, of, of these concepts in this spinning wheel model could be a serious problem for any business, and especially um, you know a small business, medium-sized business, large businesses can maybe sustain it longer than other businesses can. But any one of these could cause a business to fail. But all three of them together. Um, you know, is a recipe for disaster. And I, and I think oftentimes when you start to see one of these, you probably are elements of the others. Um, and and what, do, what do we look for in that? Resistance to change. What are, what are some of the things that, that might indicate something like that going on? You know, you have people going around saying, well, we've always done it this way and it worked. You know, or if it, or if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, those, those ideas and those kind of statements are, are the kind of things you might hear when people are resistant to change. And then the, the cultural lock-in, as, as Diane described with Sears, all of those people, all of that promotion from within, which we all kind of encourage promotion from within, but if you don't sometimes get some, somehow get new ideas into the organization and, um, whether that be with turnover or, you know, increased diversity or however you manage to do it, you, you have to get new ideas, new thought processes and that into an organization. Yeah, it's um, really that, that ego, you know, that thinks nobody can touch us and we're gonna show you this is how it's done. We don't want new ideas. All of that is really dysfunctional. Right, and that, in that culture, it does, it does kind of lock in, you know, Every, every company has a culture, probably has, there's probably multiple cultures throughout large, large companies. And those cultures are going to form whether you want them to or not. So, you, you know, the companies need to, to make sure they're taking control and, and deciding on how those, what those cultures are going to, are going to look like. So, and the assumed continuity, uh, again, as, as Diane described, you know, hey, we've been around, you take these companies that have been around for dozens of years hundreds of years and they think they 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 can't fail they're too big to fail even um well we know that's not true there is no such thing as too big to fail um and often what happens in those situations is they they don't have a, a long-term strategy you know they're they're focused on today and and not what's coming in the future they they don't have people that are um, some people say blue sky thinking or blue ocean thinking, you know, that what's that next big idea that's untapped? What's that untapped market that, uh, that is out there? Um, so th th to sum up my thoughts, you know, I, I think Diane's provided us with a, a really valuable insight into how forces inside the company um, as well as, as outside, you know, can lead to to the demise of even the largest organizations. Um, and she's provided with a great visual 
um, illustration of what that looks like, the spinning wheels, you know, the, the, the car in the sand and, and, you know, being stuck. And you're ex expending all this effort and all this energy and all these resources and you're not going anywhere. So thanks, Diane. I think it was a really great presentation and looking forward to some of the discussion we're gonna have here. Yeah, thank you so much. I really am interested in everyone's thoughts because as I said, it's a work in progress. I need further research. I need to do testing and all of that. But um, so far, wherever I've shared it, it does seem to resonate with people. So at least it kind of passes the sniff test that way. and. Uh, feel like I'm in the right direction, but very interested in everyone's thoughts. Well, th thank you, Diane. And thank you for, again, I'm going to synthesize a little bit of what Gary was mentioning. So Gary did a great job of synthesizing. Again, Diane put together this model. She put together these new thoughts, thinking about how this is built upon evidence-based perspective. And so those that are new with us, what we're going to do now is go into a breakout session. And I'm going to put the questions actually into the chat. So one of the things will break into groups of maybe three or four, and we'd like you to think about what did you hear? What were maybe some of your reactions? And then how can we bring that back to the larger group and have some of the conversation that Diane's considering us to think about in terms of this reflection? And I also wanted to just call out the, the amount of activity that's going on in the chat and a lot of great conversations that are going on there. Let's continue that in the breakout rooms. And we'll break out for probably about five to seven minutes and then we'll kind of bring everybody back. So if you have the questions, what did you hear? What are some of your reactions? And maybe there are some other questions that are surfacing now in terms of a different understanding or a thought provoking message that you'd like to share. So here we go into the breakout rooms and we'll see you back in about five to seven minutes. Hello, mother. Hi, mom. Can you even hear me?
Hey there. So sorry. It kicked me out with the internet. I was in a different group in Nicole Rowe. I don't know how to join back in there. <laughs> is this you from night? Okay. Marlene's in here too now. Yeah. We all yes, got kicked is. out. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. trying to get everybody back in, but I think what's going to happen here in one minute, we're just going to bring everybody back in. So I'm not sure which rooms you were originally assigned to. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No worries. I'm not sure what happened. It, it is one of those, um, definitely one of those days with technology where. <laughs> All right. So let me, let me, let's get everybody back. And again, I apologize for whatever happened with the breakouts and, and I'm glad you're back to join at least for the larger debrief and be able to share your thoughts. So thank you. All right, looks like we're counting down 20 seconds. Everybody should be back with us. All right, everyone's, everyone's either coming back from the breakout or coming back from being kicked out. So we've got a combination of things going on, but welcome everybody back to the, to the core hub here. There's never enough time. <laughs> never enough time. And today, again, the, the technology, I apologize to whoever ended up getting kicked out of the breakout room and trying to get you back in. It looks like there were some great conversations that were at least started. And we were kind of rallying around those thoughts of, maybe sharing what, what are some things that maybe you heard, some things that you're, you have some reactions to. And again, let's continue that dialogue in the chat and we'll save that and share that with everyone. So just, just great dialogue, but let's just open it up. And does anyone want to either jump on, go ahead and feel free to share some things about what you specifically heard and how you're reacting to that. Anyone want to start us off? I, I'll go ahead and start. Um, and, and I've known Diane for probably close to 20 years. We go to uh, church together and have, have served on some committees before. Um, I was very familiar with the, the Sears uh, story as well as Kodak. Uh, I may have studied um, case studies uh, when I was getting my MBA at Michigan in, in various classes, whether it be marketing or, or corporate strategy. And the, the thing that always... I've always kept in the back of my mind, I've worked for organizations with hundreds of thousands of people and, and basically I'm self-employed now uh, while, while also teaching part-time um, is, is the need for creative destruction and, and to be at the forefront of doing that um, so that you don't get complacent and, and it is a cultural shift. And I think some, some organizations do it better. I worked for a subsidiary of General Motors for three years you know, they would have never done it till they were backed into a corner through bankruptcy. And so I, I, I have seen what, what Diane's talking about exactly, you know, and when I look at what's going on with universities right now, I think there's a, a big component of this that that's in there. And there are some things they do that are trying to be more innovative, but maybe even just the whole university structure, the way it was set up, you know, is it still applicable in 2020 versus how it was set up in the late 1800s to early to, to mid 1900s? I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, you've got a lot of bureaucracy, you've got a lot of um, layers you have to go through and I'm not sure that they always can make the most nimble decisions from that. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for that insight. And, and again, those, those questions you're even offering. Does someone want to build on to or expand upon what, what Phil kind of kicked us off? Anyone? Yeah, Raymond. So I view that as an offer to 
uh, enter the conversation since I'm currently employed as Dean of the Schmidt Horse College of Business. <laughs> um, it's interesting because it's something we talk about. So when you think of where universities came from, back in Italy, when there were very few libraries, the scholars would go into the few libraries and then come out and report their, what they found to the audiences. And that started the lecture method. And uh, to a large extent, until relatively recently, universities hadn't moved away from that very much. So between digital and the pandemic, it has created a real shock to the way universities operate. Uh, not to mention that there's market forces like um, private companies, declining numbers of 18 year olds, uh, other, other options available to students to learn without a degree. So we are actively rethinking our business model right now because of these market forces and the need to change to remain competitive. It's another interesting piece and I asked Diane this, um, part of her resistance to change involves bureaucracy, but sometimes the bureaucracy is created by the regulatory environment. So when you think about universities, um, state universities like ours are run uh, or have to run in accordance with the Ohio Revised Code. Uh, there's also the traditions of shared governance between faculty and the administration at the university. Uh, those create a lot of processes that at times can be bureaucratic. So how do you address the, the variable of the regulatory environment as you assess the resistance to change? I wonder if I could put Cindy Hurlis or Jeff Smith on the spot. They're two of my colleagues from the insurance industry to just speak to anything that resonated for you with the model or uh, raise comments. I'll go first. Um, well, thanks for the invitation. It was, uh, I had the privilege of talking to Diane about her research, so it's really exciting to kind of see it uh, presented in this forum, So, and I appreciate the invitations to join. So, you know, I think, you know, where my mind goes with some of this, kind of building on what Raymond was saying and um, what Phil was saying is really understanding that we have to respond to forces beyond our control, and we just have to adapt, and if you don't, you're, you're going to be left in the dust. Our company's 144 years old, so we've had to adapt to stay in business. But really, I think what we've learned over the years is that it's our, it's our customer that establishes what our true value proposition is. And if you're not connected with that customer expectation, you're going to build all sorts of things that aren't valuable, that cost money. Um, and so, you know, we've really been working hard um, at our company recently to become a lot more strategic and make time for strategy. Because if you don't make time for strategy, you're just heads down, just working, 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 working. The other thing that we're trying to do is really abolish what we call command control at our company. It's kind of killing those sacred cows because we know that we're not going to acquire the right talent to our organization unless people feel like they're doing meaningful work. And so that's, those are kind of two strategies that we're employing at our company so we don't kind of get into that spinning wheel and stay in that spinning wheel. So it's developing strategies to get ourselves out of that thinking maybe. And this is Jeff, Diane, thanks. I'll, I'll echo Cindy's comments. Thanks for the invitation. Um, Diane, I, I work for Diane in a lot of ways. I work for the association and they're one of our members which Diane, I, I thought you'd be proud of. I'm using the water bottle for a night. Um, but, um, you know, she's one of the thought leaders in our business. And I was excited to see her, you know, enter into this educational endeavor to further herself, but also the industry selfishly a little bit too. I know some of the problems that she's been thinking about and trying to tackle. I think the independent agency system could benefit from that. Because like Cindy mentioned, I mean, they're 140, 144 year old company. We're a 124 year old company tip, you know, traditionally, that, that age and longevity has been worn as a badge of honor, but I think we're recognizing now that the disruptive nature of our new economy 
it's it's now I think we're looked at and viewed as being old and um, outdated and unwilling and unable to change. And, you know, to, to kind of the cycle that, you know, Diane, you put in front of us, the spinning wheel that I think, you know, organizations like ours and others that kind of struggle with is that ability to perform and transform and the balance between those two, two you know, two things, because performance is, um, you know, what we've all excelled at. It's what's given us 124 years in this business. It's that transformation, which is difficult. It's making time for strategic thinking. It's understanding where the customer is going and being there to meet them, but not abandoning what drives your revenue, what that, what is that makes you successful, what's made the foundation of what you do, but not losing sight of where customers are going. And I think it's the great struggle and the great challenge. So we, we always talk about it here around performance and trans, perform and transform and doing, the two, doing, doing those two simultaneously is incredibly difficult. I think it's you know where you find some of those examples that you've cited, Diane, and others that you could find throughout business where we're, it's so challenging for us. And the, our insurance industry, I know, is very vulnerable to that because we've been around for so long. It's such a complex business and industry that many have not necessarily tried to venture to get into it. But now I think the gloves are off. Technology is transforming our industry like many others have come, come before us. And we have to be a part of that transformation and true innovation. Otherwise, you'll see 144 and 124 and, 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 and 50 year old organizations fall by the wayside and be replaced at some point in the future. So um, yeah, I love the work that you're doing, Diane. Thanks for letting us be a part of the conversation. Yeah, thanks so much for being here and for both your comments. I'll throw it back to you, Tony. I'd like to add if anyone else, those, those fantastic to rally around here for just even two, three more minutes before we kind of offer Diane some gifts here in terms of additional research or thoughts or questions. Can we kind of build on that? I love Jeff, where you're bringing in complexity, thinking about what we need to do and bring through that transformation. I want to open it up and still be able to share. There's still, I know, a lot of comments and a lot of conversation that were happening in the, the breakout rooms. Can I ask someone else to kind of open up? It was, a, I think, breakout four or five. What else can we share? Tony, I'll, I'll share out. Uh, in our breakout room, I know that Linda um, disclosed how uh, Diane's theory also impacts libraries. And just as Phil uh, applied it to higher education, uh, in our discussion, I also applied it to um, elementary and secondary education. Uh, the system is just so old and antiquated. And sometimes we get in our own way um, when other people venture out and demonstrate that it can be done differently and it can improve the quality of, of education. And then uh, what is more, I was identifying other companies. Um, I used to work for Sears and I actually saw what I venture to say, Diane, Sears got in their own way. Um, sometimes when you just think that you've been at the top of the food chain for so long, nobody else can ever uh, get to where you are. And um, and towards the end, they started an opportunity for um, employees to really share out ideas. Um, employees had some wonderful ideas and they really could have been um, right there with Amazon had they listened to some of the young guys that were really trying to encourage them to uh, how to implement a marketplace with the catalog program. Uh, but they waited too long to kind of listen and then they lost out by not having you know, the right people in the right place to bring that vision to fruition. And so sometimes companies, you know, because they are old and it kind of goes back to something that you said, Jeff, uh, sometimes when you've been in the game for so long, you really can't see a different way and you lose the sight and understanding someone else's perspective because you only know that road that you've traveled on and you can't really begin to veer off and, and travel on a new road because it, it holds that uncertainty. You've been comfortable on the road you've been traveling on. And, and for Sears, you know, it just seemed like they were there. And uh, when they got underwater, really, it was kind of like too late. Everybody's drowning at that point. And it's like you bail, you know, you try to throw water off to, to save and salvage what you can. Uh, but uh, we also talked about, Diane, that even though uh, what you shared didn't sound like a new idea, we loved how you packaged it together. Um, to make it such a relevant theory that could be applied in so many genres of our life. So really, thank you very much uh, for the quality presentation. Thank you. 
One more, and I don't know, like, there was a few conversations in the chat. I don't know if David, you, you wanted to share a little bit. Those were kind of in alignment with the new hires and, and how I felt that was essential. I don't know if you want to add to that and share a little bit more. Um, sure. Uh, you know, I, th I think the whole idea of bringing new blood in to an organization to help shift the thinking is, is a great idea. What I have seen happen, you know, I spent, um, I spent a decade at the Boy Scouts of America and I was the new guy and got to do a lot of great things until, uh, some of the resistance began, the cultural resistance began to occur. And over time, the, the new ideas are just like, what's the point? So there's this cultural resistance that occurs uh, in organizations that will eventually squash those new ideas. So it creates a churn of, of new hires that, that come through, but over time it's just, well, you know, so I can only do so much. And you see that too, uh, you know, it's in all companies and organizations, I think, but we also see that in politics. I mean, how many times do we see people run for office with these great ideas, but the culture of the political environment squashes those ideas and drives them to um, mediocrity, I think. And that, that happens in, in many, many organizations. Just my, my perspective, I don't know how we fix that in cultures, especially the ones that the older the culture is, the more likely I believe that is to happen. I think, thank you for sharing, David. I think as, as we're kind of thinking about the symposium and what it brings where we can just name things, we can bring the evidence base and, and really follow the work that Diane's bringing forward. It's like by just, first of all, acknowledging and recognizing it, you know, is it part of the way forward in terms of these new models? And so one of the things I just want to respect for time and also I see Dr. Katie kind of joined us. So I'm wondering if we just take a few minutes kind of um, internalize and go over to the chat and what we're gonna ask you to do is not particularly to hit enter yet, but is there some research? Are there some additional comments? Is there any other gifts that you would like to offer Diane? And, and Gary did a great job of synthesizing as the thought leader here and the reflector for us. So how about if we just head over to the chat and just some things that came to mind that maybe we captured or didn't capture, what else would you like to share with Diane? But I'd like you to write it, but not hit enter. I just want you to kind of just go in and actually write down your thoughts, you kind of hold space for a minute. And then after we do that, Dr. Katie, I don't know if you want to kind of just share a few words as we kind of wrap up for the day. So you might have a message. Do you, have do that now or do you want me to do that now? Well, let's give everyone just a minute to kind of, to kind of reflect on a comment or something they'd like to be able to share an idea, a compliment to Diane. Piece of research or article or a book that she could use that she might want to read that would be great for her. Yeah, I don't have enough of those. No, you don't, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Katie, actually, do you want to walk us through the uh, the the chatterfall? Uh, sure. Go ahead. Hit enter. Let's see what y'all got. You did an awesome job. That's what first showed up. Then, uh, yeah, it was a great job presenting. Other research ideas, industry suggestions. Uh, yeah, so cool. Of appreciation for uh, that. Some suggestions, some stuff around Drucker, Rockefeller. Uh, yeah, lots of. Uh, Lots of good stuff there. So some additional ideas for you as well as uh, some appreciation. Great. Thanks, everybody. So do you want me to keep going? Yeah, keep going. Why, if you wouldn't mind sharing a few yeah, words so, here, we're just kind of wrapping well, up. So. Well, thanks. I, uh, I get to see a recording of this, and you all will too. We have a playlist. We're building out a a cool vlog, blog, uh, web page that will uh, be a podcast as well, integrated uh, opportunities for people to access the content and things that we're sharing later. Um, and uh, I'm sharing my screen here. I, uh, do you see the BGSU doctorate screen? Do you see yep. that? Yep, we're seeing it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I just wanted to, uh, I'm not sure what you gave a shout out to, and I had a little technical glitch and I invented 
thank God for our BGSU IT department. I was on with them and it took me a little while to get everything figured out what was going on. So, um, well, uh, with the Schmidt Horse College of Business, we have a focus on organization development and change. And uh, our students are coming from all different industries, all different professions. We have an incredibly uh, diverse and talented group of people with a lot of experience. And the focus of our programs, particularly our doctoral programs, we, because as you can see, we have a master's program in organization development and change at BGSU and a doctorate. And both are located in the College of Business, which is uh, AACSB and Higher uh, Learning Commission accredited, which is a really important distinction to have. And our master's program is one of the first in the world. Our doctoral program is going on its third year. Uh, we are um, getting uh, full, so to speak, with uh, students uh, within uh, the first three months of, of opening the doors for our doctoral program. So we, um, we um, are hitting a sweet spot, and I think it's because of professional joy. Uh, I think people are looking to do meaningful work, leave a legacy, particularly people who have been uh, around the block a few times, have the experience under their belt, have worked on a few things, and care about making a difference, care about transforming organizations, revitalizing communities, and developing human potential, and doing it in meaningful ways to connect to what they are personally passionate about. And the notion of thought leadership is what we focus on. Our, our uh, students in our doctoral program are creating uh, new ideas, bringing evidence out for the things that they do, and uh, they're publishing, they're writing, they're building a brand around that so that they can expand their career mix opportunities. And that means that they can, they can work where they want, when they want, with whom they want, when they want making the living they want. And if you can say you can do that around things that you care about, I think you would, all, I think you would agree that you can pause and say, I am truly blessed and I'm really experiencing the joy of my work. And, um, Focusing on developing thought leadership competencies within the context of ODNC is what we do. And so we have a wonderful group of people that have been drawn to this work. And uh, I'm really proud of our students, our program. Diane, thank you uh, for uh, doing the talk. You are a role model for us in that. Uh, same with Gary for being a discussant. We will continue to have these talks uh, every month as we showcase the great work and knowledge and, and find different ways to help uh, make a difference that matters in the world. As we say at BGSU, a public university for the public good. So uh, thank you, uh, Tony, for holding the fort down while I was dealing with the most mysterious technical stuff. I have to swear, I have never seen it before or had anything like this happen. Uh, and I won't go into the details, but uh, uh, I made it through and I'm back. So uh, again, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Gary. Thank you all for being here. I see Dean Braun. Dean Braun, thank you for coming. And it's great to have you here and have your support. And I love seeing all the other friends of mine that I see on here and our guests. And so thank you again. Tony, I'll turn it back to you. I was, can't follow up any better than that, Dr. Katie. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for holding space for all of us to come together and sharing your vision and big thoughts and ideas for us to rally around and kind of step into that space in our own learning curve. Thank everybody on the community for being here to support us as we're kind of learning our way through. And I just wish everybody a wonderful afternoon. And just again, thankful for cohort one and cohort two, kind of my, my learning partners, if you will, through this. And so I just say gratitude and uh, thank you for everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon and hopefully see you next month. Cheers. High five, Diane. High five, Diane. Here we give her a high five. Bye -bye. Thanks, Steve. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye.